Good evening, Lighthouse family. Welcome tonight to our Wednesday night Bible study. So good to be with you again in your home tonight for uh, our time studying God's Word together. Let me just give you a quick update on our uh, morning services on Sunday. We had our second week this week, and uh, what a great time we had. Our numbers increased. I think we had probably a little over 100 people that came this Sunday, and we it just each week looks better and better. I hope uh, you're doing well, and we're waiting for you to return, just uh, as God would uh, allow you to. We, we long to see you in the Lord's house, and uh, until then, stay safe, keep in touch. If there's anything we can do to help you, please uh, remember to call upon us, and we'd love to do that. Uh, let's, before we get into uh, our word tonight, let's receive our tithes and offerings. I want to thank you again for your faithfulness in giving what a what a magnificent offering we had this past week I'm just uh, I'm just almost brought to tears every week as I see how faithful you have been in giving during this time and I just uh, thank God for you and I know that he's meeting your needs because you are putting him first in your finances and so we love you tonight let me pray over our offering and we're going to get right into our Bible study tonight father in the name of Jesus we come God and Lord, before we uh, ask you to bless our offering, Lord, let us uh, just again uh, bow ourselves in your presence tonight and remember our nation and pray, God, for uh, all of those who are in authority, God. We pray, Lord, that you would bring peace to our nation, God. We pray, Father, that, uh, Lord, you would help us as Christians in this dark time to be a brighter light than we have ever been, God. Uh, Where darkness is greatest, Lord, light is greatest. And, God, I just thank you for your people, Lord, who are spread throughout this community and even around the world, God, who are called by your name. I pray, God, that we would find our place in our world and, God, just shine the goodness in the light of Jesus everywhere we are. So, God, bless your people tonight now as they give in this offering, Lord. We receive it in your name, Lord, for your sake and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, open them up tonight to the book of 2 Timothy Uh, the third chapter, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. I I want to speak to you again tonight. Uh, I just really feel like I need to, I almost have to uh, speak to you concerning uh, uh, the days that we're living in right now. Uh, It is just so captivated the minds and the hearts, it seems like, of everybody uh, what's going on in America today. And uh, I, need, I just need to, I need to speak to you. And, and I know I spoke to uh, this subject on Sunday, uh, but I really believe as Christians that we've got to stay laser focused right now uh, in the spiritual. Are you listening to me? We've got to keep our spiritual mind where it needs to be uh, and not too focused on the natural. Far too many Christians, I believe, are being led by the natural during these days and uh, they're completely missing the spiritual implications, what is happening and uh, what God is saying through these times. And uh, when you uh, get too captivated by the natural, it will end up bringing you into confusion and despair and, and maybe hopelessness and anger when we really ought to be energized right now. We really, uh, as I just prayed a moment ago, we shine brightest uh, in the greatest darkness. And and there are really some dark days that are falling upon us right now. Uh, But right now is a great opportunity for us uh, to stand up in our homes and in our communities and where we work uh, and to really be a light in these dark days. And so uh, I want to speak to you along some of those lines tonight. Now, Near the end of uh, the great apostle Paul's life, he penned uh, several short letters, First and Second Timothy and Titus, and those letters have become what uh, are known as the pastoral epistles because they give instruction to the church uh, concerning their order and their doctrine in their discipline. In, in this letter of 2 Timothy that we're looking at tonight, Paul is, uh, so to speak, passing the torch unto his uh, uh, student, uh, Timothy, who had uh, grown up in his ministry and had served alongside of Paul throughout the years. And uh, Timothy is the pastor of a church in Ephesus. And so the church and the pastor have special meaning to the apostle. Paul had helped to establish the church in Ephesus. And now 
now, uh, as he is nearing his final days, he understands that his life won't last too much longer. He is wanting to speak unto the new pastor, Timothy, of this great church and impart into him some instruction that he will need to lead the church uh, as they move forward. And as he comes to the end of the second letter to Timothy, he concludes with several warnings concerning the spiritual state uh, of mankind in verses number 1 through 5. Let's read them together. It says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And I want you to note this last statement, from such people turn away. From such people turn away. Why would, he, why would he say that? We have been, we have been called uh, unto the world. We have been sent into the marketplace of the world as Christians. Uh, Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why would he tell him to turn away? Because this isn't the world. This is the church that he's addressing. And it's so important that you understand. I'm, I'm not speaking primarily to the world tonight. The world's not listening to my message. Worldly people uh, probably won't hear this tonight. But you you who have tuned in, you are people who love God, you love the Word of God, you are, you are the church of Jesus Christ. And these are the ones Paul was addressing uh, uh, to Peter uh, or to Timothy to be careful of, uh, those that would fall into this type of a lifestyle, these who would uh, turn away from those things which are important to God. He says that in the last days perilous times shall come. The Amplified Bible says very difficult times. And as he describes these times, we soon find out that they're not dangerous times naturally. Uh, they're dangerous times spiritually. And I want you, to, want you to think about that for a moment. He's not talking about in the last days uh, persecution will be great, uh, uh, the, the, the pain will be great, the suffering will be great. In fact, what it, what it seems to me when you read what he's talking about, you really see a people more at ease, not a people that are uh, in persecution or distress. You see uh, people that are at ease in Zion. Yet he warns that stressful times for the child of God would come. Times when our faith would be pushed to the limits of endurance. Times when we will be under attack by what I want to talk to you tonight uh, uh, in the title of my message, End Time Spirits. I want to talk to you about end time spirits. And, and so ponder that, uh, what I just said and what the great apostle just said. Uh, does that not, do you not feel that? I mean, does that just not seem like where you are today? We're living in very stressful times. We're, uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing people. I'm, I'm hearing the, uh, the, the conversations and people who are, I, I mean, they're pushed to, to nervous breakdowns. They're pushed to being stressed out over limit because of of what they're seeing and what they're hearing in our land today. And it shouldn't surprise us because Paul said those times would come. You might wonder really why he would write to Timothy as if Timothy was living in the last days. He, he begins this, know that in the last days perilous times will, will come. Well, why is he writing to Timothy about last days? Because Timothy was living in the last days. Timothy, uh, like we are, is, was living in the last days. You see, spiritual time is, is not uh, uh, the same as natural time. In other words, God's clock doesn't click according to our clock because we are measuring two different things. When we think about time, when you think about time and I think about time, we think of time as it relates to us, as, as we are in time. Everything revolves around where we are in time, the past, the future. All of that uh, relates to where we are in it. But can I tell you, God's perspective of time doesn't deal with time as we perceive it. God's uh, uh, perspective of time always deals with His plan. 
God's got a plan. There was a beginning of the plan. There will be an end of the plan. And, the, and all that time is, is where, what it takes uh, to get from the beginning of God's plan to the end of God's plan. Let, let me say it um, the way Peter wrote it in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Here's God's perspective of time. It says, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends, A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise, as some people think. No, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. The only use God has for time is to finish His plan, His work with mankind. Everything else that God does is eternal. God's an eternal God. You can't can't establish the birth of God. Why? Because He always was. And you can't establish the death of God because He always will be. God was living in eternity before He ever started time. And when time ends one day, as it will, we will enter into eternity forever because God is an eternal being. And God doesn't judge anything according to time except His dealing with humanity. The only thing He he, uh, deals in time with is creation from its beginning to the end. You know, many... Theologians, if you've uh, studied uh, uh, eschatology, if you've studied especially uh, the end times and, and the things that are yet to come, you understand this because so many theologians believe that God's accounting of time corresponds to our natural week. Because of scriptures like we just read in 2 Peter 3, that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. There are other scriptures that talk about a thousand years in the Bible. And so, so, uh, so many theologians believe that, that the way God measures time is in the measure of one week. Uh, God created the heavens and the earth in how many days? Seven, seven days. And what did God do at the end, the last day, God rested when he completed the work? So if one day is a thousand years with the Lord, then a week of days would be comprised of what? Do the math. 7,000 years. Look at the Lord's clock. If that is the case, if that is God's, uh, 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 God's desire in human history, if, he, if, he's, if he's divided time into that, then look at God's clock. At the beginning of the first day, what did he do? He created Adam and he made man that he could fellowship with him and and be worshipped by him. At the end, first day, again, Sunday is the first day of the week. So on Sunday, he created Adam. On the second day or Monday, the the end of the first thousand years, Enoch comes on the scene. And what is special about Enoch? The Bible says, and Enoch walked with God. Adam fellowshiped with God. Enoch walked with God. Well, if you move to the third day, which would be Tuesday, Abraham appears on the scene. And who was Abraham? Abraham was the friend of God. So you have Adam who fellowshiped with God, Enoch who walked with God, Abraham who is the friend of God. And then if you move to Wednesday, the fourth day, David arises. And what is it said about David? David is a, was a man after God's own heart. Do you see the pattern here? And then if you move to the fifth day, which would be Thursday, Jesus arrives. The Son of God comes to earth as the Savior of the world. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy in this scripture just a few years after the death of Jesus. So what day of the week would that be? If Jesus came on the fifth day, the uh, 5,000 years of human history passed when Jesus came, then then uh, that marks uh, uh, on the calendar uh, just the beginning of that day. That would be Thursday on God's spiritual clock. Can I tell you that when you're measuring week, though, uh, measuring a week, uh, what's hump day? Hump is Wednesday. And when you get after Wednesday, you're on the downhill slide. Thursday, therefore, is one of the last days. And so when Paul wrote to Timothy that he was warning that the last days would would come, he's talking to Timothy as if they already had begun because they already had begun. He's already in Thursday on God's time clock. And that he's saying that when, when this, these last days come, these attitudes would begin to appear in humanity. 
But, but let me finish the week. At the beginning of the sixth day, uh, we come to the time at the end of the Dark Ages and the Protestant Reformation. And it was that time that the gospel began to be spread out of Europe and then to go all over to the uttermost parts of the earth. The, the, the Bible was spread through the Protestant Reformation. It was, it was then, but, but now we're still living in that sixth day of time. If that's the case, we're still there. And, and if that's true, then the year 2000 marked midnight on God's clock on the sixth day. In other words, we're coming to the end, I believe, of the sixth day on God's calendar. Hallelujah. Praise God. You say, well, pastor, that's just six days and we've got seven days. But what did I tell you happened on God's seventh day? What did God do? He rest. And of all the days on God's clock, He gives us more information about that last day than any other because He calls it the last thousand years, which will be when Jesus comes back and establishes His kingdom upon planet earth, puts His throne in the temple in Jerusalem, and rules and reigns the whole earth for a thousand years. And the Bible says that the earth will be returned to the Garden of Eden and man will rest in the glory of the Lord for the last thousand years. And the Bible says when that thousand thousand years is up. God's going to end it all. God's going to complete time. And it says time will be no more. And we will enter into an eternity with God. Isn't that exciting? If you believe that, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, uh, uh, if you think that's the case, then you, th these days ought to excite you because it just tells me that we're getting real close to the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, now, uh, why should we be overly concerned, though? You say, Pastor, we're, we're, if these things have been happened, Paul wrote to Timothy, uh, that's been almost 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote uh, to Timothy about these days, then why should we be overly concerned? Well, we should be overly concerned for two reasons. No, the first reason is time increases evil. I want, you to, I want you to think about that statement for a minute. Time increases evil. Uh, let me show that to you through the life of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel came out of bondage and went into the wilderness. And what were their sins? Well, they began by grumbling and complaining. But can I tell you, as time went on and, and the longer time went, their sins increased and increased and increased until at the end they were worshiping every God under heaven and God uh, uh, dispersed the nation and spread them all throughout the earth. Why? Because their sin had increased to the point that God had to judge them. Listen to me, as time progresses uh, and evil increases, it doesn't add, it multiplies. You know, if you put a dollar in the bank today uh, uh, and, and earn a decent rate of interest, it'll take approximately 12 years for that dollar to make another dollar. But if you leave both of them in there at the same interest, the, the next dollar will be earned in about six years. Because it's called compounding and the longer you go, the quicker it gets. And if you leave it in there long enough, you'll be making a dollar a day and then you'll be making a dollar a minute and then you'll be making a dollar a second because as time goes, things increase. They move faster and faster. And what was happening in Paul's day has multiplied when, he, when, when, when the apostle wrote and, and gave all of these things that were happening in, in uh, Timothy's day. Those things now have, are multiplying so, ever so quickly. They're getting quicker and quicker. Let, let me give you an illustration. If you're as old as I am, I'm, I'm in my early 60s. If you are old as I am, all you got to do is re remember just uh, 50 years ago when you were watching Leave it to Beaver and you were watching uh, Andy Griffith on television, you, you understand that morality then is a whole different thing than it is now. Uh, and, and, and I remember when, when a husband and wife couldn't even be shown in bed together on television. They slept in, in separate beds on, on the television program. Now, anybody and everybody's in bed together with whoever, whoever they want to be. It's, why? Because morality, as we uh, proceed, sin increases. It multiplies. It doesn't, get, it doesn't uh, uh, get, uh, just add to itself. It, it goes quicker and quicker and quicker. And we're living in, in times that Paul wrote about 2,000 years ago, but now they're multiplying moral barriers that took centuries to dissolve now are dissolved in decades and in years. And, and, and things that we once thought were totally unimaginable now are just happening on a daily basis. 
Secondly, the Bible says in Revelation 12, 12, that the devil has a watch on. Did you know that? The devil's got a watch. He's got one on his wrist. The, the thing is, though, it doesn't keep our time on it. It keeps God's time. Because the devil is not concerned about our time. The, de the devil is concerned about God's time because he understands that when God's clock runs out, his days are over. He's finished. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. The devil knows what time it is, church. Do you understand that? He's not ignorant of these times. He's not unconcerned about this time. He knows what the time is. He understands what most people have failed to understand, that Jesus is coming soon, and before he comes, he's going to do as much damage to the kingdom of God as he can. We need to be laser focused on that. We need to see what's going on behind all that's going on today in our land. I tell you, there's a devil that's stirring. There's a devil that's moving. There's a devil that, that, that is trying to, uh, all of his tricks, he's pulling out everything to, to defile and delude as many as he can. The scripture says he's angry. He has great wrath. The time element infuriates Satan so that, that he holds nothing back. And he's pouring it out right now. Only, uh, uh, only, only God knows the extent that Satan is going to in these last days to deceive and to delude people. But what I find interesting about this text is that these times that Paul was writing to Timothy about, uh, the times that we're dealing with today, will not be difficult because of the world. He, he, he's addressing, remember, the church. They're not going to be difficult because the world. The world's always been this way. I, I, I preach to you Sunday, and listen, uh, there's nothing you can do about sin except cleanse it by the blood of Jesus. The world is, is in a mess. Worldly people are going to continue to act like worldly people. Sinners are going to continue to act like sinners. They're going to grow worse and worse, the Bible says. Uh, but but it's, not, it's not the sinner that we need to be focused on. It's the saint. It's, it's the person listening to me tonight on this camera because, again, I'm not talking to the world. I'm talking, about, I'm talking to Christians. And I've got to get your attention, and I've got to get your focus and my focus upon the Word of God and the truths of God's Word because the devil is after us to kill, steal, and to destroy. And I tell you, as the church goes, so goes the world. Verse 5 says, they will act as if they are religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Let me read that one more time. He says they will, uh, after he, he goes through all of these things, he says they will act as if they are religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. For those of you that have been saved for uh, a few years, as I have, uh, let me ask you this. Have you, ever, have you ever lived, have you ever seen a more difficult time to be a Christian than the day in which we live? I want you to think about that question. Does it seem to you like, like it does to me that, that, that Christians sometimes have just simply lost their minds? They've, they've certainly lost their focus. They've certainly lost their way. I, I've, I've known people to backslide all throughout my Christian life to turn back to the world, but can I tell you today, it's, it's a whole new ball game. It, it's, shock, it's shocking and amazing what people can do. People who have served God for years. I'm talking about people that, were, that, that you thought were grounded and founded are just, are just turning back to every conceivable evil way. Christians who aren't concerned anymore about honesty or modesty or integrity. Others who come to church and want you to accept their immoral lifestyle. Uh, I'm talking about Christians. I, we accept all the world's immoral lifestyles. Let whomsoever come. If you're homosexual, come. If you're an adulterer, come. If you're a drunkard, come. If you're smoke dope, come. Whatever you do, come. You're welcome at Lighthouse World Outreach Center. That's for the world, but that's not for you listening to me tonight. I'm talking to Christians. You can't act that way. You can't live that way. Paul said, don't have, said turn away from people like that. Why? Because if you allow that in, they're going to defile the rest. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It, it becomes like a cancer in the body. That's why the church is commanded to correct. The, the church is commanded to confront its own people. Why? Because if we allow anything and everything, and yet... 
It just seemingly is, is where we co- we've come to is a world. We will accept the world like that, but, but, but Christians need to get their life in order. And, and so tonight, I, I want to warn you of the spirits of this age. They are loose right now. The devil is, is running rampant. He's running wild. Uh, if you don't believe me, turn on your television tonight. Are you listening? Uh, I, I, I'm, again, I'm not going to get into the, the specifics of the issue. I'm just simply, if you want to see hell on earth, just turn on your television tonight. Watch ABC World News. Watch CBS News. Watch Fox News. Whatever your persuasion, just turn on your television and see a world that is run amok with end time spirits. Everything that the apostle wrote in First, Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5 is on your television tonight. If you wanted to write a better description of America today, you could not do a better job than what Paul wrote to Timothy 2,000 years ago. And, And so my challenge to you tonight is, number one, I want to expose them. And number two, I want to help you to understand how you can overcome them. Because they are going to try to do to you what they have done to far too many already. When, when I talk about battling demons, when I talk about end time spirits, I, uh, unfortunately so many times Christians get in mind uh, the exorcist. They, when you talk about demons, they think about furniture moving around in the night. Uh, but but uh, we often assume that when the preacher's talking of, about demons, he's talking about demon possession. But let me tell you something about about demons because the Bible helps us to understand. The Bible tells us that there are levels of demons. There's a hierarchy in hell. There's principalities, there's powers, there's rulers of darkness, there's spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible talks about familiar spirits. There's a distinction in the powers that war against this earth. And we have an adversary, the devil, who the Bible says one-third of God's angels rebelled with him. When he rose up and said, I will exalt my throne above God's, there were a third of the angels who said, Amen, preacher Lucifer, and they followed after him and they failed. Why? Because they had the same heart and the same agenda. So they are his partners. They are, they are, uh, they are his army, so to speak. But listen carefully. I I want you to understand. They're not motivated like most armies. They're not motivated out of loyalty to the devil. They're not motivated out of unity to him. They're motivated by one thing and one thing only. They're motivated because they hate you. The devil and demons hate you. And why do they hate you? Because you love God. And because they were not able to overthrow God, they're going to do everything they can to hurt and punish God and overthrow the kingdom of God on earth to the greatest extent that they can. And and, and so we have an adversary uh, that's out there that is motivated by hate. But by the time you see demons, by the time you see the exorcist type of demons, by the time you see, uh, um, you see demons that are uh, filling pigs and, and driving people crazy into to the graveyard, could I tell you, these demons are what I want to call gutter demons. These aren't principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. This is, the, this is the foot soldier of demon. This is the lowest level, the lowest class. We would think of them as the most powerful, but they're not. They're, 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 just, they're just doing the dirty work of others above them. They're, they're in the trenches of the warfare. And so if you have a life, if you know someone like that or, or if you are like that, I mean, if your life is, if you have manifestations of, of demonic power in your life, can I tell you, you have become so bankrupt by that time, so devoid of God by that time, that, that you're dealing, you're, you're dealing with the, the lower levels because you've already come into an agreement. You're already walking in, in the power of temptation that has is, that is attacked you and, 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 the, and the subtle agreement that you've given and manipulated of the devil you've given place what the Bible says given place to the devil and when you give place to the devil I'm telling you you give him an inch he'll take a mile and, 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 and people that are in that state have become devoid of relationship they've become devoid of prayer they've, they, they've emptied themselves by the time you get to that state you're in a real mess but when I talk about a fight with demon, and, and I, want, I want you to listen to me very carefully when I talk about uh, the warfare with demonic forces Listen, when you're really in war with with a demon, you may not even know it. Are you listening to me? 
I'm talking to Christians. When you're in, a, in warfare with, with, with a demonic spirit, you may not even know it unless you're strong spiritually. Unless, you're, unless your heart is focused on God so that you can easily discern the, the impact of a spirit upon your life. Can I tell you, the, the most talented demons are those that sound the most like angels. The Bible talks about them. They will come even as angels of light. And when they want to attack you, they don't come in and say boo. They don't come in and shake tables. They, they come in and do crazy things like that. What they do is they come in and they'll give you a word. Huh. Are you listening to me? I'm not against a word, but could I tell you, I've heard far too many words that didn't come from the throne room of God. They came right out of the pits of hell. I'm talking about, I'm talking about a good intention Christians who come to you and they say, the Lord told me or I got a word for the Lord or somebody try to give you a word and it's the most crazy thing you've ever heard. Can I tell you? That didn't come from God. That came right out of the pits of hell. And the reason these demons are so talented is you believed that what they were saying came from God instead of from hell itself. And I'm telling you, it happens all the time. It, 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 it manifests itself in Christians all the time. Why? Because they've, they've fallen away in their relationship. They've opened a little bit of a door to Satan. And they've come in and, and the devil is beginning to, to impress and, in, in, uh, and touch their lives in such a way that they believe that what he's saying comes from God itself. The world is in deception. The Bible says that they are blinded. The lost people of this world are blinded by the God of this world lest they should see the glorious light of the gospel and be saved. And so, so today when I hear, listen, when I hear Christians, when I hear politicians, sometimes when I hear even preachers, listen to me now. When I hear even, even good intention, good good, good. Uh, uh, good-hearted people, but when they began to bring to bear in these last days and began to talk about what's going on and how to solve it and how to resolve it, listen, if you don't bring God and the devil to bear in the conversation, I'm wondering if you're deluded too. Because you can't get away from it. You can, you can talk about all of the world's ways of, 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 of making things better and changing things. But can I tell you, if you don't understand, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. And we've got to understand there's a war for the mind of the people of God. And Satan is, is bound and determined. He knows his time is short. So evil spirits affect Christians, but they can only do it as you allow them access. That's why I keep saying you've got to remain laser focused on the spiritual. You've got, to, you've got to keep your mind and your heart towards God so that when the enemy comes spiritually to de deceive you, you can discern that. And the access point of the spirit the access point of the demonic, the access point of, of the spirit of God is through the mind. And when, when you allow a spirit to access the mind, the Bible says they build what we call strongholds. And from that stronghold, they move in your life to advance their kingdom. When you see a Christian, listen, when you see a Christian habitually doing things that you know are not right, I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm not saying they don't know the Lord. What I am saying is, is they've allowed something in their life that is operating and it is, it is manifesting and it's demonstrating itself from a strong place that they've allowed in their lives. You can't get away from that. Oh God, help me with this tonight. I pray that you can receive this. And as they're allowed to stay, they began to restructure our thinking. They began to, to work in the mind so that we began to think in line with the age in which we live. We began, in other words, to think along natural terms instead of spiritual terms. We began to think along uh, the terms of the enemy instead of God himself. Listen, let me give you an example. If you're on social media right now, You'll, you can give me a great big AM. If you're, amen, if you are a Christian today and you're on, on social media, I can almost prove this. All you got to, just go on there right now. Uh, well, not right now. Give me just a minute. Let me finish my message. But then go on there and just scroll through. 
And you know what? You know what you're going to see? You're going to see people that you know because a lot, you're a Christian and you friended all of these other Christians. It, just scroll through and, and, and hit on your Christian friends and, and, and see what they're posting. You'll find Christians that are posting, posting uh, uh, statements and thoughts and, and comments by worldly people, blasphemers, people that hate God. And they're, they're relaying those on social media. But at the end of it, they try to bring God into the conversation. They try to, they try to mix the blasphemous statements of people that are devoid of God with God himself. Just right there. You'll see them. They'll post a prayer one day, and the next day they're, they're half naked, amen, in the, in the post that they show. You'll see Christians. I've, 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 I'm not, I've, I've just gotten totally off social media until the church started going online, and now I've been online watching our, our program some and, and on there, and I, I remember why I got off. You see post after post of Christians. I'm talking about people I know used to come to church, used to serve God, and they'll try to post something about God, and they hadn't been to church in six years, ten years. They never darken the door, and yet they, they try to bring. But the problem is, is the two never shall mix. And, and they've been deceived, and they've been deluded. And Satan has launched a last-day offensive in America. And his offensive is for the mind of men. He wants the mind. If he can get the mind, he's got the rest. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, the Bible says. We are, we are be being bombarded on every side today by the mind of men, by, by, by demonic forces that are operating through people to speak into our hearts and our minds to delude us and to deceive us into believing the things uh, that are his. Can I tell you uh, something? Homosexuals don't want their rights. That, that's just a front. Homosexual people don't want their rights. You know what a homosexual person wants? They want you to agree with them. They want you to have the same mind that they have about homosexuality because they want to be accepted and they want to be received. And, 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 and it can't be. Why? Because it's, not, it's against the mind of God. It's against the purpose and the plan of God. Abortionists put all of these commercials on television trying to sway your thoughts about abortion because they want to change your mind. And on and on, the spirit of, of, of the enemy is at work to bring us all into this new truth, the devil's. He wants to expound the devil's thoughts into this world and, and as Christians receive that. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. I, I spoke to a pastor today and, and here's the problem. It was the problem in Paul's day, in Timothy's day, and I think it may be even a greater problem today. The world is not the problem, the church is the problem. The church has become so deluded and so... so um, so unholy and so unrighteous and so ungodly. We've bought into the, and have, we think and, and act and speak like the world does. I, I'm not talking about everybody, but there's a large majority of people who call themselves Christian. And then we go right back out in the world and we, we've lost the power. We have no influence. Our, our words are meaningless. Why? Because our lives are just like the rest of the world's, And we espouse the very messages that, that Satan uh, has put into the minds and hearts of people. And, 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 and so the problem is, is that on and on throughout this age, the devil is at work trying to, trying to push a new truth. That's why I preach Sunday, truth matters, because the only thing that really does matter is truth. Not the devil's truth or your truth or my truth. It's God's truth. God's truth matters. It's the only thing that does matter. That's why the central battlefield today in America is public school. Why? Because the easiest way to train a mind is to get it while it's early, to, to impart and to, and to speak into the hearts and minds of children because uh, as you speak into them as a child, uh, it's very hard to, to unwind that. And they're so easily molded and, and television plays a part in that and media plays a part in that and Hollywood plays a part in that and on and on and on, Satan is speaking in time spirits are at work today to delude and to destroy the minds even of the people of God. Can I tell you that's why God gave you the Bible that's in your lap? Because God wants to do the same thing. God wants to change your mind. 
God wants through the Word of God to wash the mind of man and to, and to help you to think in line with the Word of God. That's why we're to study the Word. That's why we're to eat the Word. That's why we're to love the Word. That's why we're to memorize the Word. We're to to discern the Word. Because the Word is the only thing that will change a man's heart and mind. So the question that that we have to answer is, who has our mind? Does does the Spirit of the living God have our mind? Are we focused? Remember I told you I, I want to get you laser focused? Where's your focus right now? Is your focus on God, the things of God? Are you so wrapped up in, in, in all of the stuff that's going on on television? You're trying to, you're trying to make your stand on this, this issue or that issue. Listen, get the mind of Christ and then go into the world where all of these other people are confused and shine a light of the Word of God that will dispel the darkness. The, the, if they're blinded, they've been blinded by the God of this world lest they should see the glorious light of the gospel and be saved. How shall they see unless there be a preacher? And how shall he preach? unless he be sent we've got to renew our minds with God's word and go out into where people are and change the world and make a difference in the world so who has your mind well let's just discern it real quick and I won't be but just another few minutes but, but let's discern it from this scripture where is your mind well Paul gives us a real clear understanding in this scripture The first first thing he talks about flows out of this term, lovers of themselves. Lovers of themselves. And can I say this is the basic sin of humanity, the love of self, self self-love. Do you know what love of self is? And I'm not saying that you don't love self, but I'm saying that you love self more than God because when you do that, and how do you know that you love, oh, I love God? Well, who gets first? Do you get first or does God get first? Who gets first of your time? Who gets first of your money? Who gets first of your service? Who gets first when there's an objection between you and God? Who gets preeminence? If it's not God, it's self. And, and self-love is nothing more than idolatry. In fact, it's the fi- vilest form of idolatry. Because it deprives God of the worship that's due into His name because you worship yourself rather than God. And it it places a rival God upon the throne of your life. When this condition grips the church, it, it will be much more widely exhibited in the world. In other words, when, when the church becomes comes to the place where we, like the world, give ourselves preeminence, then that only influences the world in their way in their desire to do the same we're known today as a me society why because everything focuses on me it focuses on my my rights and my desires and my goals and my things but can I tell you that's not the word of God God's God's word is never about you God's word's always about others it's about him first here's the great commandment you want to know what the great commandment is and all the other commandments are wrapped up in this one love the Lord thy God first and foremost with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love me. No, love your neighbor as yourself. If you love you, then love other people just like you. He said, in these, all the other commandments are fulfilled, and truly they are. But we, we, we all, everything flows out of this first statement that Paul makes because people are lovers of themselves. Look on television. <laughs> I, uh, it won't be hard to find out. It won't be hard to see. Who do people love? They love them. They love their opinions. They love their ways. They, they love themselves. And it's, it, it's, it's against the very nature uh, of, of God in us to love ourselves first. Out of this flows all the other things in the list. He says lovers of self and then covetous. Covetous means a strong desire to have that which belongs to another. That in itself leads to many other sins, theft, looting, adultery, even murder. All of these things come out of a covetous heart. Then he says boasters. Boasters are those uh, in love with themselves. People, when you're in love with yourself, people will boast of their views, of their opinions, while being contemptuous of others. God forbid you dare uh, have an opinion that's different than anybody else's. They will shout you down. They will will deride you and derail you and mock you. Why? Because their opinion is so high and and so lifted up that, that they're the only ones that can have one. 
They will, that leads to pride, proud, self-loving people become arrogant, stuck up. They think themselves better than others, more deserving of life's benefits. Can I tell you that racism, if racism is a problem, racism is a result of a prideful heart, a pride that exalts itself and believes itself better than others. Then he said blasphemers. The word there means to speak evil of others. How many blasphemers have you heard talk today? How many, how many of you have you listened to on the television or, or on social media? But it's not only others that they blaspheme, it's God himself. And you say, well, I haven't heard anybody say anything about God. Can I tell you, whenever you have an opinion that contradicts and goes against the very word and the will of God, can I tell you, you've just blasphemed God out of your own mouth? You might as well have called him uh, the worst of names. If, if, you, if you take his commandments lightly, if you, if you reject his counsel, if he's spoken to you and you've rejected him and rebelled against that, you're a blasphemer. Number five is disobedient to parents. Selfishness breeds rebellion as rights become more important than responsibility. Uh, and then men and women, uh, they reject the very first commandment with promise. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon this earth that the Lord thy God has given thee. Can I tell you how, to, to what shame are many parents when they're turning on their television in these last few days and possibly seeing their son or daughter doing some of the things that are being done right now. In the name of justice, in the name of, of liberty, in the name of freedom. But no, they've, they've, they, they've followed a new way. They've, they've given in to a new mindset, a demonic mindset, not a spiritual mindset. They're unthankful. Selfish people believe that society owes them something. It owes them a living, owes them comfort, owes them happiness. Benefits and blessings are considered deserved and not earned, making gratitude to either man or God not, not, not uh, needed. They become unthankful. They become unholy. When individual rights become supreme, any practice becomes acceptable. The word means unwillingness to observe even the basic decencies of life. It, of life. It's, it's the a flaunting of ungodly actions. And surely so many do those things. Without natural affection, a self-centered society loses respect for any kind of relationship. It becomes heartless, lacking the normal bonds of affection, such as a parent for a child or a, or a husband for a wife. Truce breakers. Let me, let, I don't even need to, to give definitions for these. You, just by hearing them, you can, you can see in the mind's eyes how, how literal and how clear the apostles spoke 2,000 years ago concerning the last days and understand we're there. False accusers, people that don't accept blame, they, they push blame. They're never responsible for anything. If they're, if they're guilty of anything, they push blame on other people. They falsely accuse others. Incontinent, that means lacking self-control, self-indulgent. Fierce, that word means hateful, brutal, untamed, vicious, lawless. And my God, are we not seeing that on the streets of America I'm talking about uh, people that are, that are throwing bottles and throwing rocks and, and, and oh, they're angry. I don't care if they're angry. They're, they're, they're expressing themselves in ways that are against the very thought and very heart of God and they're, they're, they're manifesting the very works of the devil in the earth. And God forbid a Christian do that and yet there are, uh, there are Christians that are doing those very things. Despisers of those that are good. They detest people who in insist upon things like integrity and character and responsible behavior. There are people that would mock me and laugh at me tonight as they hear this message and say how out of touch I am. They would, they would despise those things that I'm speaking that are good they're, because they're of God. Traitors, heady, it means reckless, impulsive, acting without or considering the consequences, high-minded. And, and then it says, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Because self, listen, because self is God, because they've placed themselves on the throne of their own life, then self-satisfaction, self-gratification becomes more important than God. They love what pleases them more than loving God himself. And then it says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It will not be a society, Paul says, without religion. It will be a society without God. 
And they'll adopt faith that makes no demands, but a faith that makes no demands offers no salvation. And that's where we're at. That's, that's what we're seeing. That's, that's the spirits that are work. They've been at work for 2,000 years. They've been at work since the apostle wrote this to Timothy. They're still at work today. And as God allows time, and listen, I, I know I gave you the time frame, and those, those may not be literal exact 1,000 years, uh, but I believe they're general in scope because I believe that, that we're coming very close to the end when the Lord himself will return, when Jesus will come back to this earth. And the devil knows that his time is short and he's doing all that he can to deceive the hearts and minds of men. We, we, we don't have to guess. It says the, the, the answer is in the, the one phrase, they deny the power. So the answer is in accepting the power, in receiving the power, in living the power. What is that power? Well, uh, we don't have to... Guess about that because Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. When you, have, when you allow the cross of Jesus Christ to have an effect upon your life, can I tell you, when, when, when you bow at that cross and you lay down your life at that cross and you yield yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ and allow that cross to, to have its effect in your life. It becomes, listen, it becomes the very power of God in you. The word of the cross is, is that which puts to death the natural life. That's what the cross does. When, when, when someone was put on a cross, they died to themselves. And can I tell you that's God's command for us when, when He saved us, that we are, to, we are to remain at the cross and we're to come to the cross. The Apostle Paul uh, said this, I die daily. And only as I die to myself, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not lover of myself, I'm a lover of God. And as I allow myself to die every day to myself, I tell you, in that act of death, Jesus, listen, Jesus died, but three days later, praise God, the power of the resurrection raised him from the dead, hallelujah, to seat, be seated at the right hand of God the Father. In that same power, the Bible says, that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you and me tonight if we will also die to ourselves. If we live to ourselves, then, then we deny the power. But if we die to ourselves, the power of God lives and abides in us. And we have the power to live victoriously over all of the works of the devil, over all of the things that are going on in this world today. You don't need to be hopeless. You don't need to be in despair. You don't need to be all in anxiety and worry and fear about what's going on in America Listen, church, this is our time to shine. This is our time to get focused. This is our time to come to the end of ourselves and allow the power in the life of Jesus Christ to come alive inside of us so that we can make a difference in the world in which we live. We need to go out to where the people are, and we need to be a light in a world gone mad because Satan's busy, church. Are you listening to me? He's, he's busy. And don't you just think he's busy in folks that don't know God. He's busy in folks that do know God. And he's trying in every way that he can to get your mind, to change your mind, to turn your mind. Oh, at first he'll do it subtly, but in the end, he'll take you to the furthest limits that he possibly can. Can I ask you tonight to rise up in the power of the cross? Can I ask you tonight, and, and listen church, I, wanna, uh, I, I, want you to, I want you just to close your eyes right where you are, and I want you to get your focus back. I want you to get your focus right back on where God is. Get it off of all this stuff. Turn off that television. Listen, it's doing you no good to watch riot after riot and protest after protest. Cut off that television and get on your knees and pray. Get into the Word of God and begin to renew your mind and say, Lord, I've been thinking all of this stuff, but God, I, I don't want to know what the world has to say about this. I want to know what you have to say about it. And can I tell you, you'll get a word. It won't be from Satan. It'll be from the throne room of God. God will speak into your heart and into your life. And God will empower you send you out into a world that's gone mad and use you to be light in the midst of maybe the greatest darkness we've ever seen. We're living in the last days in the end time spirits. Listen, the devil is not going to slack up. He's not going to slow up. The Bible says that things will get so bad that in the end, the love of many will wax cold. God forbid. 
that to be in your life or in my life. That our love would wax cold, that our love for God and our love for people would grow hotter and hotter and hotter until Jesus blows that trumpet and descends from heaven. And we who are alive and remain are caught up with him in the air to ever be with the Lord. God, let us occupy where you come. Let us stay busy in the kingdom until that day. Let's pray tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. God, I recognize and I understand that, God, we have a real enemy, God, that is at work in this world today. But, God, I thank you. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. God, we don't have to fear. We don't have to worry. We don't have to live in anxiety and, 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 and be hopeless in these days. But, oh, God, let us rise to the occasion. Let us put on the mind of Christ and the heart of God. Let us die to ourselves and be resurrected in power so that we could speak your word to a world gone mad. We love you tonight, God. We're grateful to you, Lord. God, we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name we ask it. Amen and amen. God bless you, Lighthouse. Thank you for tuning in tonight. We love you. I hope to see you Sunday, but if not, it won't be long. God bless you.